breaking and entering, drunk and disorderly, law and order. A former prosecutor and a defence lawyer, not your typical pairing. And the result? Conversations about crime and punishment that are guaranteed to get you thinking. Welcome to Justice Matters with Joe Crowley and Lizzie Green, a brand new weekly podcast. Our episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Check out our Instagram for clips at Justice Matters Pod. Enjoy the episode. This episode contains discussions of violence, domestic violence, assault, including assaults on children and sexual assaults. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Justice Matters, conversations about crime and punishment. Today we are having another special one-off episode. We're interviewing Jodie O'Leary from the Queensland Law Reform Commission. Welcome, Jodie. Thanks, Liz. Great to be here. So we're talking about a criminal defences review. Um, Listeners of the podcast from the start would remember that one of our earlier episodes talked about the defence of provocation and the issues that we perceived within that defence. And not long after that, the QLRC, the Queensland Law Reform Commission, announced a review of criminal defences. So we're just going to be talking about what is potentially going to be coming up in terms of law reform. So I think maybe we should start with a broad question. What is the Law Reform Commission? Yeah, so there are a number of law reform commissions throughout the world. They're not everywhere, um, but they certainly exist in the UK. They exist in Australia and most of the jurisdictions. So there's one in Victoria, there's one in Western Australia, uh, one in New South Wales, and obviously Queensland has its own, as does the Australian Law Reform Commission exists as well. Law reform commissions are independent of government. So The Queensland Law Reform Commission was established back in 1968 and the commissioners are uh, esteemed members of the legal community, so judges usually or retired judges, legal practitioners of um, particular standing, solicitors or barristers or uh, legal academics who look at the law, um, consider the issues that have been referred to them, usually by the Attorney General in Queensland's case, and then make recommendations as to what the way forward potentially should be uh, in terms of law reform. But the recommendations that law reform commissions make aren't binding on government. So whatever recommendations the Queensland Law Reform Commissions make, um, the government will consider whether or not to include them or amend them or uh, draft legislation in the way that's suggested by the Law Reform Commission, uh, and then it'll go through its regular process. So it's an independent body, um, mostly with people of high standing, high legal standing to provide independent advice um, to government about particular issues. So it sounds very academic for members of the public. What what is the function of the QLRC on their behalf? So one of the things that's part of our current review is that we will consider what the community standards are in relation to uh, the defences that are before the commission. So, um, for example, we'll be considering whether the law complies with what um, the community expects. And so in order to do that, we're going to have to ask questions of the community and find out what the community does expect around the law and around punishment, etc. So it does definitely listen to the people when it comes to investigating the topics that they are reviewing. Yeah, it's definitely one of the biggest things about the Law Reform Commission and part of our work is to do a lot of consultation and engagement with the community and with um, legal stakeholders, but not just legal stakeholders as well. Um, So with this review, potentially, we'll be considering the views of victim survivors of domestic and family violence. We'll be considering the views of victims of crime, um, as well as perpetrators of crime, but the community more broadly as well. Well, that does sound promising in terms of, you know, making sure that the criminal justice system is working for the people. So when we think about the current review that we're here to discuss into criminal defences, how did that come about? 
So this review came about as a result of an earlier task force that was established by the Queensland Government, which was called the Women's Safety and Justice Task Force. And that task force was established uh, in 2021 in order to look at particular issues around um, coercive control and whether or not it should be criminalised or was effectively um, considered by Queensland laws, as well as to look at other issues facing women and girls within the criminal justice system. So that was a really significant um task force that reported uh, and in that report they had two versions of the report um, sorry two volumes of the report and uh, one of the recommendations out of the many many recommendations that were made was that um, the Queensland government that the Attorney General refer to the Queensland Law Reform Commission this issue as to whether or not the defences under the criminal code are fit for purpose effectively. Um, so looking at the defences of self-defence, provocation, uh, killing for preservation in an abusive domestic relationship, um, those are the offense, defences that they want us to look at. And they wanted us to also consider that in the context of the mandatory penalty for life imprisonment for murder in Queensland. So that task force recommended that that review be sent to us because the terms of their reference was much more narrow and related purely to sort of the gendered terms of the task force, whereas the defences that we're going to be looking at have a much broader ambit and can encompass uh, other sorts of relationships, including, you know, where there's offences of violence, men against men, strangers, acquaintances, also family members and intimate partner violence. So it needed to be a much broader review. So I think um, just to be sure we're all understanding, when we bandy around this term defences, when someone is charged with an offence, obviously we know the onus is on the prosecution to prove that offence beyond reasonable doubt, but there is always the opportunity um, for an accused person to raise a defence to challenge the case put forward by the Crown. And so these kinds of arguments are encompassed in legal terms like provocation, I was provoked into committing the offence, or self-defence, I acted to protect myself or another person. Uh, and so these are specific to application by an accused person, but they have been subject of criticism, some of them, for many years in terms of how they're being relied upon and the circumstances in which they're successfully raised. So for me at least, I think this is definitely time to look at what we are getting right and what perhaps is not working so well with these defences. Yeah, they've definitely been around most of these defences since the time that the criminal code in Queensland was established and um, there hasn't been a large number of amendments made to them. There have been some reviews and some changes have been made, particularly to, prov to provocation, which we'll talk about, but um, there ha there's certainly um, suggestion that they haven't necessarily evolved to keep up with the current community expectations. And interesting that you talked about gendered issues with the women and girls because I was talking about this topic with my students because I like to share all of my areas of interest and one of them mentioned that a lot of these defences are perhaps more male oriented. If we think about the types of offenders who often rely on provocation or the types of offenders who are in a situation where self-defence might become available. It is often men um, because of perhaps the difference between men and women and the use of violence being more, well, I shouldn't say more, but often being a resort of men. So it's interesting that out of the women and children task force, we are now looking at defences that perhaps are more relevant to male offenders. Absolutely. And and that's one of the criticisms of these defences, and it has been for some time, and certainly was a criticism that the task force raised, which was that gendered nature. They These offences, rather, these defences were developed at the time um, when the um, conduct that was being considered was two men of equal size and strength having some sort of 
physical conflict usually. Mm. And the defences that have been uh, developed as in response to those types of confrontational situations take into account things like whether the response was proportionate and reasonable. And that doesn't necessarily coincide with the experience of uh, women if they are resorting to the use of force in response to violence that's been perpetrated upon them. Because there's a lot of research that suggests that women are more likely to resort to the use of a weapon, for example, because they are potentially um, trying to change that balance, make it more balanced, if you like, because they're in sm of smaller stature, etc. Yes, yes. Interesting. So I guess we'll probably have a little chat about each of the defences that are under review. And I want to start with provocation. It is one that I struggle with. Uh, and I know that there has been reform already in quite recent years trying to limit the circumstances under which someone can argue that they were so provoked by something that they killed someone and have that act as some kind of partial defence at least to a murder charge. I guess we need to think about why, why are we even wanting to limit it? What, what are the issues with that defence of provocation to murder? So there have been a number of issues that have been raised in relation to that defence and they relate to and there's been a number of reviews that have already been undertaken um, both in Queensland and elsewhere about um, this particular defence. For example, uh, the Queensland Law Reform Commission got to consider the defence back in 2008, uh, considered the defence of provocation then and it sort of noted that there were quite a number of issues that had been raised before um, including whether or not or why in fact we are um, privileging resort to uh, force because of the emotion of anger over other sort of emotions. Um, so that's one of the questions that's raised often about why provocation um, is a defence that reduces culpability when, when mercy isn't, for example. Yes. So I think, um, and again, I talked about this or we talked about this in the first episode we did, but the case of SIBO which was a Queensland case, was, I think, a trigger for that review back then. And if anyone can remember the case of SIBO, he was 28 at the time, 30 when he came to court, and he had bashed his ex-girlfriend to death with a tire iron after she had taunted him about his sexual prowess and her having sex with other men. And he raised the defence of provocation as a defence to murder and in fact a jury accepted that any ordinary person would have or could have responded that way and he was convicted of manslaughter only and sentenced to 10 years. So to my mind that sort of scenario encapsulates what is the problem with provocation to murder is that, you know, how can you justify or allow some kind of excuse for killing someone when that is the final, most final outcome. You know, it's not a punch. This is, this is killing, stabbing, shooting, extreme aggression. And we say, oh, but we can understand why you did it. Mm, yeah. Well, that certainly um, it was the impetus for the 2008 review, the SIBO case. And as a result of the Law Reform Commission's uh, review, the law was changed and it was changed to remove the ability to, or the aim was to remove the ability for mere words. And I think you mentioned this on your earlier podcast, episode one, to remove the ability for mere words to be enough to amount to provocation and to remove the ability for uh, instances where people were trying to leave a, a domestic relationship and for that to be enough to amount to provocation. And the um, Law Reform Commission made those recommendations to exclude that type of conduct. And they did that in the context of the terms of reference that they were given at the time uh, by the Attorney General, which included that um, the mandatory penalty of life imprisonment for murder was not 
going to be changed. There was It was stipulated in the terms of reference that the government did not intend to change that. And so that couldn't be part of the initial review. That's not a constraint in our current review. So that makes things quite different because it was found at the time that although provocation was operating as a gendered defence, that there might be situations, there was a concern that there might be situations where victim survivors of domestic and family violence might try, might need to rely on that defence of provocation to reduce a charge of murder and the resulting mandatory life imprisonment to manslaughter. And so there was a concern if we took, if we abolished that completely, that that would remove that ability for those people as well. So that's why there were some limits that were addressed at that time. And then there were limits later on that were addressed by a separate committee around um, homosexual sexual uh, homosexual advances, uh, unwanted homosexual advances. Um, and again, then that became another limit to the defence of provocation, that that could not amount to provocation. And that was a big one because, and in fact, it's not, it's not, designated as homosexual advances that are now yeah. not sufficient. It's any sexual advance, unwanted. But it, that, you know, brings to mind the case of Green, not any relation of mine, but a high court decision where a fellow had been drinking with a friend. Um, this friend had made some overture towards him and he'd said, I'm not like that, but the friend persisted. They were both quite drunk. They were in a bed together and Green just lost it at this touching by the other fellow the, who was the victim then. There was quite serious violence that ensued and the victim died. He wanted to rely on provocation, saying that when he was touched in that way, and those advances were made, it triggered for him memories of his siblings being abused by their father and he just reacted very badly. So back then, and I can't remember what year this was, um, but Green, the High Court said he was entitled to the defence of provocation, which one reading of that is that, you know, it's acceptable to kill someone because of an unwanted sexual advance. That was sort of the the message subliminally from that case. But so interestingly, even with these changes in recent years to that defence, to cut out provocation on the basis of unwanted sexual advances, there was an article that said if Green was tried now, it's likely the same outcome would ensue because he had the added complicating factor of being triggered by the abuse he knew his siblings had sustained. And so then I think it's that, you know, ability to say, unless there are exceptional circumstances, which leaves the door open for the types of cases where we tried to remove the defence of provocation to still potentially be argued. And I think that's where we're really stuck and we need to really get into the nitty gritty and say, okay, what do we actually want this defense of provocation to look like? Mm, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, that issue as to whether or not there should be these exceptions and whether those sort of technicalities can, uh, whether technicalities can be then used to um, to avoid culpability or to reduce culpability in the terms of provocation is certainly a question. I don't know if it even needs to go as far, though, as determining whether or not these circumstances were exceptional. I mean, there has been a case recently, a 2020 case of Penny Amina, um, where they didn't actually look at whether or not the circumstances were exceptional. I, they didn't even get that far. So this case um, caused a large outcry, and it was one that the task force uh, had made mention of as being particularly concerning and it sort of generated interest in this particular review. So Mr. Peniamina was charged with murder of his wife, Sandra, and he admitted to killing her. He admitted that he intended to kill her. He thought that she'd been unfaithful. He had some suspicions and had spoken to his aunt about that um, prior to, 
on the day of the uh, event in which he ultimately killed her, he had found some messages on her phone and confronted her about those messages. And she responded by sort of telling him she didn't want to talk about it and he hit her as a result. She then moved into the kitchen and um, this is from the context of a previous history of violence, but she moved into the kitchen and and grabbed a knife and um, was heading back out when he came towards her and tried to grab that knife off her, but because he's coming from the other side, he grabbed the blade of the knife and as he pulled it away, it cut his hand. Karma. It was in the context of she was potentially going to leave him. Potentially the the exception or the limitation that provocation shouldn't apply in circumstances where you want to leave or change the nature of a relationship should have been applicable here. But the way that it was argued by the uh, by the defence was that he wasn't provoked by the fact that she was going to leave the relationship. The provocation was the act of cutting him with the knife. And so it came down to a discussion about what is meant by the words based on um, in relation to those particular limitations. And ultimately the High Court took a narrow interpretation that based on was effectively causative. And so what had caused the response from him was the cut to the hand by the knife. Um, And so he was then sent back for a retrial because he'd earlier been convicted by a jury of murder. murder. Uh, He was sent back for retrial and um, on the second occasion he was convicted of manslaughter. So the jury has accepted that he was provoked uh, and he was sentenced to 16 years imprisonment instead of the mandatory life Life. because it was a manslaughter conviction. So, I mean, to me, there's problems there, A, because really, let's be serious, he was angry because she was leaving, because the relationship was done, he'd been cheated on or whatever the case may be. That is what fueled his anger. But even if we put that aside... I still struggle with him being entitled to this defense because, okay, he suffered an injury from the knife. Well, that's because he grabbed the knife. And how do we say that that is sufficient to cause any ordinary person to respond by killing them? So it's, to me, it's problematic all the way through that he was entitled or that he was found guilty of manslaughter only. I think a good lawyer can use the defence in a way that perhaps was not intended legislatively and which in fact does not represent justice. Well, there's certainly members of the community that would agree with you and there was community outcry as a result of Penny Amina and that's one of the things that the Commission is going to be looking at. As I said before, we're going to be examining because we're supposed to say whether or not the current legislation accords with or reflects contemporary community standards. So we're going to be looking at whether or not the community actually does think that that type of behaviour should either reduce some level of culpability or whether there should be um, a complete sort of acquittal or whether they, they shouldn't be given any sort of a benefit of that at all. That's something that we'll be examining um, and researching further and, and engaging some research for well, I'll be watching this space. I did I did just say to my students this morning that I worry about the value of a human life when we accept arguments like this for provocation. And I, I specifically feel really strongly about the mum who was recently killed and her body was stuffed into a wheelie bin and she was dumped in some bushland. I think how have we got to this point where every week we're reading stories where human life is just so undervalued that people are getting broken up with or they find out there's been cheating or they feel like they've, you know, become so angry they have no other option. And I think we might need to be at a point where we say that's no justification for taking that life. 
So watch this space with that one. <laughs> um, all right. So that's that's provocation. That's just the tip of the iceberg. The next area that's going to be under review is self-defense. Yes, self-defense. Yeah, self-defense, which, look, I teach criminal law, I practiced in criminal law, and I can tell you that self-defense in the criminal code, the three different provisions that exist to argue that you're acting in self-defense or defense of another, I, I preface every lecture on this with these provisions are very complicated. And I think that that's probably my biggest concern when it comes to the defense of self-defense. I think there's a place for it. Absolutely. But what is the review going to look at here? So one of the issues that we've specifically been asked to look at is whether or not the provisions on self-defence should be made simpler uh, and clearer. Um, And that's kind of arisen out of a number of cases where there have been comments made, uh, both from academic commentary, public Uh, members of the public, but as well as the judiciary about the complicated nature of self-defence. So there was a recent case, a case of Daney, where uh, the judge in that case made reference to um, some New Zealand legislation. At the time, New Zealand had legislation which was much more complex than it is now. And that judge commented about how difficult it would be for jurors, as the people that are deciding whether a defence applies, to follow the rules around self-defence. And so Justice Dalton said the same could be said effectively for Queensland. Um, And now New Zealand has replaced their self-defence laws with a a single sentence effectively that does the same work or puts to do the same work as uh, our much more complicated provision. So it's something that uh, we'll definitely be looking into. Oh, good. I like I like that. I do think absolutely there is a place for this defence. And I think, um, if I'm correct, one of the concerns with this review is how these defences might work for victims of domestic or family violence who perhaps at the end of their tether or, you know, we know that phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back, fight back unusually. And often when they fight back, it is fatally because if they don't, the consequences for them will be catastrophic. And so it's been problematic in raising some of these defences that are easily raised by men because the circumstances of a victim of domestic or family violence fighting back are a little different. Um, So what, what sort of impact will those considerations have Yeah, we definitely have to look at that specifically as well. That's another specific area that um, we've been asked to consider is the impact and whether or not we need to expand the defence of self-defence to be able to more effectively include uh, victim survivors of domestic and family violence, particularly those who are subjected to coercive control because the way that the law has initially developed is very much an incident-based response to violence and the women who are responding in these situations are responding with a mu- within a br- much broader context of violence, which isn't reflected in necessarily the incident, which is under consideration by the jury. And it has been used successfully, self-defence has been used successfully in Queensland um, in non-confrontational situations. And in fact, Queensland's one of the only places where that's happened. Mm -hmm. Um, For a particular female, the case of Falls, I think you know about that case. Yeah. So, I mean, so so the problem for victims of domestic or family violence relying on self-defense comes down to the fact that firstly you have to have been assaulted in order to raise the defense of self-defense and then secondly you have to have this belief if you kill your victim you have to have this belief that there is no other way that you can respond and that the force that you used was reasonably necessary in the circumstances. And if I just, before we get to falls, take a little detour, there was a case of secretary, which actually was from the Northern Territory, but she was um, a victim of domestic violence from her husband for their entire marriage. 
He had escalated in recent years. His drug use had increased. His violence against her had increased. And on this one day, there'd been an altercation and um, he'd been quite physical with her and he said to her, I'm having a sleep and when I wake up, I'm going to kill you. And she, because of the abuse, fully believed that what he had said to her was the truth and that when he woke up, he would kill her. And so while he was asleep, she killed him. So she wanted to raise self-defense. And the first question was, well, she wasn't being assaulted at that time. And the courts were able to say, well, she had the threat of an assault. It was a continuing threat. So that was okay. Um, And so it was available to her, but it was very difficult to raise. And so then we fast forward however many years and we've got a recent case of falls. And so she was charged in 2010 with the murder of her husband. Now, um, she didn't dispute that she had planned the murder. She had illegally obtained a gun uh, two weeks before the offence. And the way that she killed him was she ground up sleeping tablets and put that in his meal. And then when he was sound asleep under the influence of those sleeping tablets, she shot him in the head. She then disposed of his body and she did maintain the fiction for some weeks that he was missing. She made public appeals to try and find him uh, before she was, you know, identified as the perpetrator and she was charged. So Falls was, you know, not someone who you would typically think of necessarily as a murderer. I've had these conversations with Joe. He doesn't like it when I say that. But she was a white, um, middle-class mum of four, you know, The term hockey mum was bandied around. You can picture her going out with her kids, taking them to sport. Um, She had no criminal history. Uh, She'd never used force against her husband before. She didn't have a history of self-medicating with drugs or alcohol, which sadly is recourse for many victims of domestic and family violence. Uh, And so it was a bit of a different case, I guess, for the courts. Now, she had been subjected to serious abuse, psychological, um, physical, financial abuse throughout the relationship. And she'd hidden it. She hadn't told anybody. So she hid her injuries. She um, never complained about it, but it was getting increasingly worse. And the trigger for her to kill her husband was that he said that if she didn't do as he said, because he was restricting her and she had to ask permission to do everything. Mm. And her mother was meant to come and visit and he didn't want her to come. Obviously, it would have been an insight into their home. And he said, unless you cancel your mum coming, I'm going to kill our child. And the child was three at that time. Mm. And Susan Falls had just reached breaking point And that was it for her. She was like, I, I, I believe he will kill our child. I have to do something. And that was how she saw her way out. So... She actually committed that offence quite soon after a new defence had been brought in, which was killing in an abusive domestic relationship. And that defence was brought in, as I understand it, to capture offenders who would not be entitled to self-defence because there was no assault or because it wasn't deemed to be the only reasonable option. Uh, And this covered people in circumstances of domestic and family violence who do fight back or do kill under those circumstances. The big difference is that the defence specifically tailored for domestic and family violence is only a partial defence. So it just reduces a murder charge to manslaughter, whereas if she was able to argue self-defence like Secretary did, that's a complete defence and she would have been acquitted. And so I think this is another area where well, Falls did get acquitted. Yeah, so this I, I, the defence was uh, was available. Um, the new defence was available to her. But this Susan Falls was one that was able to successfully argue That's right. that self-defence should apply. So even though the partial defence was introduced to, uh, to fill, I guess, some gaps around um, whether or not there was access to the complete defence of self-defence, it doesn't mean that women can't try to use self-defense and she certainly did yes sorry Um, and the but 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 it's quite rare is our understanding um especially for these sorts of non-confrontational situations for um that's 
defence to be successful. And in fact, there's been some commentary by some academics and there's a very um, well-respected academic by the name of Heather Douglas, Professor Heather Douglas, who's done some work, a lot of work in domestic and family violence areas. And she has made comment that this particular case, although it meant that self-defence worked and she was acquitted, because Susan Falls was, um, as you mentioned, white, middle class, did not fight back, those sorts of things, that she had that defence more readily available to her than other situations where this type of conduct and, and homicides in intimate partner situations occur. And um, so that's, I think, why the second partial defence, the secondary sort of partial defence of killing for preservation was available. And it, it has been used on a number of occasions now. Uh, only We've only sort of found two that we know for sure um, it has been used in. And that was one of the criticisms of that particular defence, which was from the task force. They said it, it just hasn't been used. So what's because the point? why would you use it? If you are someone in that kind of situation of domestic and family violence and you have killed your partner because of a history of abuse so shocking that this is the only thing that you can see as an option. And we know from all of the research that you can't impose on someone who's the victim of abuse regular standards of response or reaction part of the whole abuse is that they can't see any other way out that they are trapped and that that's why so many stay and we all know the most dangerous time for for women or victims of abuse is when they decide to leave and so this is you know all of these factors play into it but so why would you if you're in that position argue a partial defense and end up with a manslaughter conviction and 10 years or so in prison when self-defence is right there that operates as an acquittal and recognises that you really were defending yourself. Well, they still can argue self-defence and have it as an alternative, right? But but at the same time, I, I think you said um, we all know that uh, this is the response that victims of domestic and family violence take. But I'm not sure that we do all know just yet. Um, and the thing with falls, and I think the reason why self-defense was successful in that particular case, and one of the reasons that's been sort of bandied around as as why it worked in that case was because the judge in that case was really alive to the expert evidence that was presented about domestic and family violence and the different ways that women in those situations can react. Um, and so that judge, um, there was expert evidence that was provided and that's not always available to people. Mm. And that judge really directed very carefully and told the jury how they could make use of that evidence with respect to self-defense. And that that's great that that happened in that situation, but it not doesn't necessarily always happen. And I think that, um, and again, there's been some suggestion that that is one of the big concerns about killing for preservation is that if people are faced with um, either running a trial and potentially being convicted of murder and getting a mandatory penalty of life imprisonment because the jury doesn't understand necessarily their context and where they're coming from. Or the judge doesn't direct in such clear terms. That's right. So they could get convicted or they could have a trial and put themselves through that. Or they could plead guilty um, to manslaughter in situations where they say um, the partial defence of killing for preservation would apply and say that to the prosecution, say, look, we'll plead to manslaughter on this basis. The benefit of that being that then there is a discretionary sentence available to the judge. Usually they've spent quite a considerable amount of time in custody prior to that. And so they sort of see, well, what, what, what have I got to lose here? There's no, I'm not going to spend any more time if I plead guilty. They're making those decisions because perhaps they don't trust the result that the jury might give them. And that's, that's one of the criticisms of this defence is that it actually potentially undermines um, 
the resort to self-defense. Yes. And I think, I think you're right. I do say we all know, but perhaps we don't. And I, I tried to find this case. I remember reading it in the news, so I can't um, 100% verify the facts, but there was a woman who had been the victim of domestic violence. And on this one occasion, she was ironing a shirt for her husband and he criticized how she ironed it and he hit her um, and opened up like there was a photo of her in the paper and she had quite a lot of bruising and cuts on her face but she responded by hitting him with the iron and she did kill him and she was for whatever reason I obviously the media didn't go into detail and I couldn't find the case but she was convicted of manslaughter uh not murder but manslaughter but self-defense was not open to her because of the difference in force at the time, I think it was. And so then you do question, okay, that's a lack of understanding of the nature of that domestic violence relationship and the reactions of victim survivors. Mm, absolutely. And that, I mean, there are cases, like I said, there's, a, there's been a couple of cases where they've used uh, this killing for preservation to reduce murder to um, manslaughter and been sentenced in that respect. Both of the cases are actually from Cairns, interestingly, and uh, there's a couple of uh, factors that are similar to them. One was um, a plea. So the perpetrator who killed her partner in that instance decided that she would um, make submissions to the prosecutors to say, I'll plead guilty to manslaughter on the basis that this is um, I killed in preservation. And the other, they made the offer to the prosecution, but the prosecution rejected that um, and ran the murder trial and she was convicted of manslaughter on the basis of killing for preservation. But in both of those cases, it was quite intense violence that these women had been subjected to in the past, but also very um, recently. recently. So in one of the circumstances, the one that was a plea, um, she had been dragged outside by the hair, he, she'd been hit, then she was urinated upon and he said something like, oh, I should get rid of her or something like that. Um, and it was at that time that she grabbed the knife and responded. So th that one and then the other case was even, even more intense in that he had recently raped her anally uh, with a a, a bourbon bottle and he then um, she'd left and come back and he threatened to do it again and it was at that time that she had actually pocketed a knife before they left the house before he made that threat but he'd threatened to do it again and, and she responded and killed him now that was the one that the plea um, wasn't accepted right and it, she was ultimately convicted on that basis but um, those cases are ones that academics have said they are really self-defense cases yes why um why was it self-defense and, and do you know what penalties they got yeah so seven and eight years um respectively which is insane mm. so there's this issue about i guess that their convictions were of manslaughter not of murder which is something that i think we need to think about too when we're thinking about if we do say, um, and none of this has been decided, I mean, the commission, these are issues that the commission is Have asking to look at. for submissions on and, and want to Explore. review. All right. So I think we could probably talk about these two defences all day. We both have such a vested interest in it and, and a, a need to see what we can improve on here. But I'm conscious of our time and I know we also have two other defences which maybe are not as dramatic when it comes to outcomes but I think are very interesting as well that are subject to the review. And the first is the other version of provocation which is provocation when you are charged with an assault. So you punch someone in the face and cause a blood nose and you get charged with assault occasioning bodily harm and you go to court and argue I was provoked because he called me some horrendous name. And we say, fair enough, anyone would have reacted like that, not guilty. 
So what's what's the purpose of the review for this particular defence? So just like killing for pre- preservation and killing for provocation, killing on provocation as well, we're just looking at whether or not this defence uh, accords with current community standards, um, at whether or not it has just outcomes and those sorts of things as well, whether or not it needs to be repealed or whether it should be amended, for example. So this defence, um, it's an interesting one because it is – such a unique defence in in Australia and, in fact, worldwide in that only Queensland and Western Australia have this defence. Uh, it came about from the writer of our criminal code who had seen killing on provocation as a defence and thought that probably we should have something similar um, for offences of assault. And so, so just this- for just for our listeners, this person wrote the criminal code in 1899. Yes. So it's a very, very old genesis of this. Absolutely. Um, and and I mean that was at that time we were thinking about provocation as sort of uh, matters of honor between men, etc. That's sort of the context for them. But at the same time, killing for prov- provocation, killing on provocation had been around for a long time, mm. the common law before that. This hadn't. This is only in existence in Queensland and Western Australia. Right. So um, it's very different uh, because it doesn't exist in other jurisdictions. It did exist in the Northern Territory for a little while, but they repealed it as well. Uh, and one of the main concerns with this particular defence is that it is limited to offences for which assault is an element of the offence. So, for example, if a woman is charged with wounding her partner in response to some sort of violence, then uh, she can't use this defence because assault isn't an element of the wounding. Yeah, it's limited. That's right. So it does depend on the charging practices of the prosecution. So what they decide to charge, they could have charged uh, assault occasioning bodily harm whilst armed, which would allow the defence to exist, or they could charge wounding. And as we said before, we know that, um, and the research has shown not our research, but research from other academics has shown that women do resort to using weapons more often. So if they are using knives, et cetera, that would exclude provocation. So that's one of the things that we will be looking at, but also just looking at whether or not it's appropriate to have it at all or whether it should be um, some sort of mitigation um, in sentence instead. Yeah, Yeah, I guess it comes down to why what you said at the start, why are we making allowances for a base emotion like anger but not necessarily other potentially justifiable responses? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one, which, look, as a mother, I am interested in this one. And can I say at the outset, I um, I think I'm a good mother and I treated my children well, but there is a defence called domestic discipline which, to my understanding, says that you are allowed to use reasonable force to correct your children's behaviour. For the purposes of correction, discipline, control or management. Okay. And I I see a lot of children (laughs) who need correction, discipline, control and management. But I guess the problem here is that it is saying, well, we'll let you smack your child, for example, uh, if you can give us good reason why that was reasonable in the circumstances. And that, I think, is a slippery slope. A little sidebar, it does remind me a little bit of what I read about um, happening under Putin's rule back in 2017 when he decided to remove criminality for domestic violence by saying that what happened in uh, a home was for the people in the home to um, deal with. Mm. So what what he said was moderate violence within families should be an administrative issue rather than a criminal offence, meaning that beatings of spouses or children resulting in bruising or bleeding, but not broken bones, would result in a fine or 
otherwise 15 days imprisonment, but no criminal offence. And so he was essentially saying, go ahead, within reason, you can beat your family and, and we won't have anything to do with it in the criminal justice system. Then to even make that worse, there was an article that came out that talked about the advantage of wife beating and it was in the science section of a popular Russian magazine and it said recent scientific studies show the wives of angry men have a reason to be proud of their bruises. Biologists say that beaten up women have a valuable advantage. They more often give birth to boys. So, you know, we're not quite at that level but domestic discipline I guess would be one of those that could be quite controversial. Yeah, I do think that it will be reasonably controversial. Um, it's interesting because it exists in every Australian jurisdiction. Queensland is certainly not alone in mm. this regard. Um, so it, it is everywhere else. And if Queensland was to remove it, we would be the first, um, which would be interesting. I think there's a couple of aspects of controversy around this. Not only does it apply to parents and children, but it also applies to teachers and students. So I think there's a real um, concern from teachers that if they aren't allowed, if this defence doesn't exist, then they can't, um, you know, put their hands on a young person to try and move them a particular way or something like that. Or there might be particular circumstances that they're concerned with the way that they respond. Um, I should say that the teachers would have all the same defences available to them as everyone else. Mm. Um, so, you know, there would be questions around consent anyway and there would also be if there if that young person was really using a significant amount of force, that teacher could rely on self-defence, yes. for example, et cetera. But I think where it becomes... Um, really interesting is is this issue of what is reasonable and I think um, there has been some research that's shown that the community standards around this have changed somewhat since this was introduced and those um, that research sort of says that people aren't feeling corporal punishment as a way to go anymore and certainly recognising more the impacts, the harmful impact of corporal punishment on children. Mm. So there's been a shift. At the moment, the test is still what's reasonable. And uh, this question of what's reasonable can differ. Uh, reasonable minds differ on what's reasonable. Yes. Um, so there's been cases like uh, there was a case in a couple of cases in Queensland, one where a father was charged with assault occasioning bodily harm whilst armed against his 14-year-old daughter. So he had struck her on the buttocks multiple times with a bamboo stick after she swore at him and defied him in the use of an iPod, I think it was at the time. Medical evidence showed in that instance that she had bruising and she said she couldn't sleep because of the pain. And he tried to argue um, domestic discipline as the defence to the AOBH whilst armed in that particular case. The jury rejected that defence. They said it wasn't reasonable, reasonable and he was convicted. And there was a later case where a stepfather was uh, charged with assaulting their 14-year-old stepson. There they said that the stepson had been ignoring him, um, needed discipline. He dragged him outside and hit him and then kicked him while wearing steel cap shoes. Oh. In that instance, um, the magistrate didn't accept that that was reasonable either. But there was a South Australian case, if you can compare it, uh, where there was a finding that, that the behaviour of the parent was reasonable. And that was where the father was charged with uh, assaulting their 12-year-old son, so a younger, mm. um, younger boy, He'd been disrespectful throughout the day. Uh, the father had told him and tried to tell him to use his manners, um, tried to correct him in other ways. And the boy, you know, responded dismissively, roll of the eyes, the sorts of things that you can imagine. Very familiar. <laughs> the father turned the boy's face towards him with his hand and then um, the boy tried to move away and fell down and the father smacked the boy three times in quick succession then at, while he was lying down. In that case, um, the boy said the pain 
in the leg wasn't serious and there was no bruising. But the magistrate originally convicted the father. So originally the magistrate thought um, that it wasn't reasonable, but on appeal it was quashed and said that it was. Okay. So it's still an issue of, you know, how far do we go yes. um, with this? And I think now with the Human Rights Act that puts another um, – layer layer on it absolutely yeah i think i think we are definitely in a climate where corporal punishment is not the norm but then we also have the need to have boundaries and expectations and and teach kids particularly if we think about juvenile crime where are the boundaries but that's a discussion for another day um so look i'm i'm really looking forward to reading the submissions that come in in relation to this review. I think that getting opinions from those in practice, people in the community, victims, perpetrators even, will really paint a a very clear picture of where these laws are lacking perhaps or where they need to be reformed. And knowing that, you know, you and the QLRC are at the helm, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of this review. Uh, I think we probably need to wrap it up there, even though we could chat for hours. But Jodie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk about all of this. No problem. And I just, I mean, certainly it's not me that's going to be making these decisions. It will be uh, the commission. But we do want to hear from the community as much as we can. We want to hear from people who are interested. You can go to our website, have a look. Hopefully we might be able to put a link in the show notes um, to uh, register if you're interested in this particular review. And we'd love to hear from people about their stories, about their experiences, about what they think about these things at any time. But ultimately we'll have a consultation paper that will come out and we'll ask for formal submissions at that time, but any time before that. And I do think people need to know that opinions of the people, of the community, are always taken into account with these kinds of reviews and inquiries because at the end of the day, that's where we learn the lessons uh, and get and get the stories that make a difference. So I also would encourage people who have something to say to say it. That's that's what, you know, you should be doing. Yeah, I really appreciate you having us on. Thanks. No worries. Thanks, <laughs> Jodie. Thanks for tuning into this episode. You can find links to the cases that we discussed in the description. You can also find a link to Guardian Criminal Law, and a big shout out to them for making this podcast possible. The majority of criminal cases involve people, normal people, people like you, people like me, who find themselves in an unusual set of circumstances that would not usually occur in their life. My name's Mark Savick, and I'm here to assist you with your criminal matter. I look forward to hearing from you and being of assistance to you. If you're interested in clips, you can look at them on Instagram and TikTok. Just search for Justice Matters Pod. See you next episode.